Well, good afternoon. It's been wonderful to spend some time with Lan and Pam and others here in Champaign. I feel like when Lan talks rightfully about the insanity of war, this is one of the centers of sanity, right here in this hall and amongst people who've worked so hard on, on issues ranging from immigration to ending wars to um, trying very, very hard to preserve our fragile environment and all the while educate our neighbors and ourselves. So thank you very much. I was looking forward to coming here and I'm happy to be here. It, you know, I suppose there were many, many times when we'd look upon arsenals, manufacturing, storing, selling, using weapons, and think, well, weapons are manufactured in order to fight wars. But isn't it perhaps a little bit of the opposite now that um, wars are manufactured in order to sell weapons. We're in quite a fix. And increasingly, companies like Boeing and General Dynamics and Lockheed, uh, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon are uh, gaining more and more and more control in our civic society, especially now as it's almost as though you could say the national religion is becoming militarism as we live in a permanent warfare state. So what we're up against is, is, is pretty huge. I sometimes liken it to brush fires. You know, you think, all right, that war is blazing out of control, and then the awareness that Lan has talked about and the, the outrage and the education and the effort pours forth, and one war is sort of stamped out or tamped down, and you turn around and there's another war, another new war. And, you know, throughout, I think we have to rationally recognize that with all of the goodwill and the effort and the volunteerism being directed towards solving problems related to immigration and the environment and racism and mass incarceration, I know I could go on, we cannot rationally even discuss solving any of those problems if we don't tackle United States militarism, which is consuming at this point at least $717 billion this year of United States resources and energy and economy. So I, I, I know that what we're up against with regard to the Pentagon is enormous, and yet I think that some of the most essential learning that can come our way actually comes from listening to the people who are bearing the brunt of our wars and have very little likelihood of escaping. And so it's not a new war, it's been going on since 2015, certainly, but I'm thinking right now of the country of Yemen. Is the United States at war in Yemen? Yes. Both in the United States attacks, ostensibly um, directed toward eliminating Al Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, but um, not so reliably actually going after Al Qaeda targets. And then there's this uh, unusual situation in which the people the United States is very much allied with in the Saudi Arabian military and government and the United Arab Emirates military and government are themselves allied with many of these Al Qaeda groups. But I'd like to think about what we can learn from villagers in Yemen. So I want to start by turning the clocks back quite a bit to 2016. The month was September. And in a very remote village called Ahab in Yemen, villagers had decided, you know what, if we wait for the government or an NGO to help us find water, we might all thirst to death in the process. So we're going to do it. We're going to collectively pool our resources, do this cooperatively, and much to their relief, somebody who had a little bit more resource than the others came in on the project and they managed to set up a rig to drill for water. And the rig kept going down and down and there's no water and there's no water. The water table in Yemen has been precariously going lower and lower, but finally, lo and behold, they hit water. Well, this calls for a village celebration. People turned out, they danced, they sang, they celebrated having struck water. The sun had gone down, it was dark, time to go home. And as they were returning back to their homes, a huge Raytheon manufactured bomb was dropped by the Saudis on that very village. Did they think the rig was something else? The villagers were stunned. People were maimed, decapitated. And this was kind of the middle of the night. So the next morning, 
People got up to go and see what happened if their loved ones were missing. Could they find them? Uh, it, could they be of any help? So more and more people assembled. Some of the adults couldn't grab the kids back, and kids are curious. So the kids were part of the crowd of about 100 people, and warplanes returned. And survivors said it was almost as though the warplanes were trying to chase the people that were running away. 31 people killed, many dozens more maimed. It's not as though there's a hospital nearby. The hospital doctor talked about what a hideous day it had been trying to, under the siege that has already been imposed on Yemen at that point for a year and a half, they didn't even have the parts or the equipment they needed. And so that was the village of Arhab on the night and the following day, having struck water with their cooperative efforts to do so. In 2017, President Trump did what presidents very often do when they're giving a State of the Union speech. He hadn't been president long enough for it to be called State of the Union, but the full Congress, all the senators, all the representatives were assembled, and President Trump had in the gallery somebody whose emotional situation would sort of galvanize emotions that President Trump wanted to see raised, and so in the gallery, was the widow of a Navy SEAL, Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen, who had been killed while he was in the line of duty with a Navy SEAL's action, a night raid. And so President Trump pointed to the widow, and immediately everybody in the huge hall stood up and began applauding her. The standing ovation and the applause went on for about four minutes. And really, that's kind of a long time if you've got national cameras focused on you. And the woman began to tremble. She began to cry. Ivanka Trump, Trump put her hand on her shoulder. And President Trump shouted over the applauding crowd, you know he's in heaven. Her husband, Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen, you know he's looking down at you. You know we'll never forget him. But you know, at no point during that speech or in the commentary immediately following it, at no point did anybody ever say where Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen was killed. He was in a remote rural village in Yemen. It was called Al and the Navy SEALs had been told that there was somebody that was part of the Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula who was a high-value target, and their job was to go in and get this guy. Well, the Navy SEALs are some of the most professionally trained warriors in the world, and they've rehearsed this many, many times. So they came in with their helicopter, disembarked from the helicopter, broke into the home. There was a big, huge commotion. It was noisy, and what they hadn't counted on is that people from neighboring villages heard the commotion, came running with their guns, and they quickly disabled the Navy SEALs' helicopter. So the Navy SEALs had performed their duty, but then how are they going to leave? And a firefight broke out. So they called in air support. And this means, of course, that the huge war planes that are part of the United States military capacity to attack flew over the village. There couldn't be very much clarity about who lived where. And so a group of children were huddled with their mothers in one particular I think you'd call it a hut, really, a, a mud home, a very, very simple home. And all of a sudden, a missile tore through the home. And Fahim Mohsen was the oldest. She was there with her six children, and her sister was there with her children. And they looked to Fahim what to do. And she had to decide, do we go outside, shepherd the children out the door into the night, and hope to avoid a second attack, or stay inside because we don't know? And she chose the former. And she was shepherding the children out the door. She had her newest born infant in her arms, stepped outside the door. Perhaps it was the heat of her body that communicated to a sensor exactly where she was. And a helicopter gunship's bullet went right through the back of her head, killed her instantly. Her child mercifully suffered only a graze to the forehead. Her five-year-old son gave eyewitness reportage. I have a hunch that perhaps no one who was in the speech audience, the audience for President Trump's speech, 
had any idea that on the night that Ryan Owen was killed, in that village, 26 Yemenis were killed, 10 of them were children under 13 years of age, six were mothers. And so from that village, I believe we learn the hard lesson so necessary for our country, but so elusive, so obscured, that exceptionalism is simply false. We are not exceptional on this planet. We do not have an automatic God-given right to resources and to life and to extended happiness and extended resources that others can't or shouldn't have. And the third village I want to think of is actually one of many villages surrounding in Yemen um, a smaller city, a fairly major city called Sada in the north of Yemen. And they were just children. They were on a bus, on a field trip that was a reward to them because they had studied. They had studied hard over the hot summer months and their teachers were going to take them on a picnic. And, um, well, you know what kids are like. Some of you have been chaperones on field trips, and you get them on the bus, and they're all squealing and kind of squirming. And they had cell phones, and they were filming each other. They were so excited because they'd each been given a blue UNICEF backpack. And those backpacks are so valuable to the children's families because UNICEF packs them with vitamins and children's antibiotics and vaccines. So these are life-saving backpacks, and the kids knew that after their field trip, they'd go home with a backpack full of what the family would be so pleased to get. And there on the bus, the teachers had mostly gone out into the marketplace to get supplies for the picnic, and all of a sudden, a Lockheed Martin manufactured missile was dropped right on the bus. The explosion ripped apart children's bodies, Pity the emergency medical technology people who arrive at the scene and have the macabre and the heartbreaking duty to try to reassemble the body parts. They could only identify 36, but um, the school believes that 44 children and several teachers died that day. The children helped to dig the graves for their classmates. And some months ago, they returned to school carrying their blood-spattered backpacks. More recently, in a village called Kifat in Yemen, villagers were congregated at the entrance to a hospital, and some of the workers in the hospital were also gathering. And uh, about a week and a half ago, a Saudi coalition-led warplane bombed at that entrance to the hospital. Um, again, people were killed and maimed and wounded, and this was a Save the Children hospital, and Save the Children officials expressed their outrage. Um, but you know, that tactic of bombing hospitals has been so common that one of the saddest tweets I ever read was put out by Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. They asked the question, is bombing hospitals the new norm? And I would submit that one of the green lights for bombing hospitals actually happened in October of 2015, when the United States, in the northern province of Afghanistan called Kunduz, relentlessly bombed a Doctors Without Borders hospital. So I just want to tell you briefly my own personal encounter with a part of that story. I have O negative blood, so they're always happy to see me at the Italian Surgical Center for Victims of War, a wonderful hospital in Kabul, because if I donate that blood, then you know that goes to any patients. And so I was over donating blood, and some of the young Afghan peace volunteers have now joined me in doing that. And so after we had donated the blood, I, I asked the doctors in the Kabul hospital have you still um, been treating any of the people who survived the bombing of the hospital in Kunduz? Because I'd heard that even though it was a five-hour trip, the uh, Italian hospital had taken in as many as 91 people who were in desperate need of treatment since the hospital had been destroyed. And, and they said, oh, Alora, yeah, he's so lonely. You take your friends and visit. And so we went to visit Khaled Ahmad. And Khaled Ahmad was a student pharmacist, and his mother had begged him 
do not go to work today, my son. The Taliban are fighting the government forces. It's too dangerous. And Khalid had said to his mother, but mom, you know, 359 people were treated last week, and 50 of them were children, and you don't want me to stay home, and the children won't be treated. Of course I must go. And anyway, if, if the hospital is in danger, they'll evacuate us to the airport. Reassuring his mother, he took off for work, he did his shift. He and the chief hospital pharmacist then went to catch some sleep in the basement, and at one o'clock in the morning, they were shuddering with a huge explosion. It was a C-130 United States air transport vehicle that was outfitted with Beaufort cannons and Gatling guns. And when it flew around the perimeter of the hospital, which was about the size of a football field, the, this warplane specifically targeted not the laundry, not the um, storage facilities, not the cafeteria that was empty, but rather the intensive care unit and the emergency room. And after they had done one round of bombing with these incendiary devices and the hospital is in flames and the security people can't figure out what in the world is going on, the plane flew away and returned in 15 minute intervals for an hour and a half, repeatedly bombing the hospital. So Khaled Ahmed and the chief pharmacist looked for security people and said, well, what do we do? And the security people said, well, you know, hey man, the, the patients you've treated are burning in their beds. There's nothing you can do, just run for it. And so they were coached to take their cell phones out of their backpacks because they were told by security that these warplanes can target in on a human being by cell phone signals. So they quickly took out the batteries from their cell phones and then the security guy said, okay, there's the front entrance, run for it. So the chief pharmacist ran as fast as he could and he made it out the front entrance door and then it's time for Khaled Ahmed. And he said his heart was pounding and he ran as fast as he could. He had one foot out the front gate and he caught shrapnel right in his back and began to bleed so profusely that within no time he was beginning to feel dizzy. He'd become paralyzed on his left side. He rolled himself into a ditch. And in Afghan culture, if you know you're near your death and you can, you try to contact your father and tell your father you're sorry for anything you ever did to hurt him or hurt the family. But Khalid had already taken his cell phone apart. So he managed with the one arm that's still working to fish the cell phone out of the bag, put the battery back in. He reached his mother. He begged his mother, put my father on the phone. His mother is in a panic. Where are you, my son? He reaches the father. And fortunately, his father was able to pinpoint exactly where he was in the hospital compound before Khaled lost consciousness. And the father told Khaled, take off your vest, put it underneath you, it'll stop the flow of blood. So Khaled did that, and the next thing he knew, he was in a body bag. And he said to people as best he could, I'm not dead, I'm alive. But you see, his relatives had raced to the hospital entrance, found him in the ditch. They didn't have a stretcher, so they placed his body in the body bag. And it must have been a very, very rough ride, five hours to get to the Italian hospital. There's no other hospital in the area. Now that hospital in Kunduz is destroyed and in embers and rubble. So the Italian doctors and nurses and staff were able to save Khaled's life. When I met him, he was very, very thin. He had an internal catheter, an IV inserted. He could only walk with assistance. He was kind of yellow in complexion, but he had survived. I think he felt something like survivor's guilt as he talked to us about the fact that 43 people had been killed that day and 13 of them were hospital staff, his colleagues, three of whom were doctors. And then he realized that I didn't look Afghan. So he asked my young friends, who's she? And they told him, well, she's from the United States. And he looked at me so directly and asked, why would your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. Why would your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. At the end of October, 
Saudi warplanes attacked a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Yemen. And when Ban Ki-moon said to the Saudi military, in fact, it was General Asiri, whose name you might have seen in connection with the um, killing of Jamal Khashoggi, General, Brigadier General Asiri said, I think kind of tongue in cheek, well, we'll ask our American counterparts for advice about targeting. Well, of course, the American t counterparts have just bombed a hospital in Kunduz. And so the green lighting goes on. The United States maintains Guantanamo, seems to show no remorse for the torture and the cruelty that has and continues to take place in Guantanamo. And then we find out that in Yemen, the United Arab Emirates are maintaining 18 clandestine prisons where torture is ghastly. The United States has set the green light for war, displacement, destruction of infrastructure, scorched earth policies. And so uh, others say, well, this is what works in this world of ours. And I believe that the Saudis are not so much interested in fighting a proxy war with Iran. I believe the Saudis are wanting to plant their flag on new real estate, and Yemen will do just fine. When I was a college student at Loyola University, Mundelein next door invited Noam Chomsky to speak. And I was just uh, um, in awe of the man's intellect and the breadth of his ability to talk about foreign policy. But he sort of summed up everything he seemed to want to say to us by saying that the United States has made it clear to every other country around the world, if you do not subordinate yourselves to serve our national interest, we will eliminate you. I believe that human security is not the same thing as national security. And human security is so much more important than any one particular nation's particular security. And human security in our time, when we're facing the ravages and the eventual increasing consequences of global warming, human security rests in being able to cooperate and jointly tackle the common problems we all face in spite of our differences, which are not nearly as important as the threats that we face. We ought never to listen to anybody talk to us about terrorists without first saying, talk to us about the greatest terror we all face, the terror of what we're doing to our own environment, to the possibility for planetary survival. So we are in great, great need of rationalism. And I think that um, one way to, to learn what we need to learn is to pay very, very close attention to what the people who can't escape from our wars are trying to say, and will again and again and again here. Conserve and share resources. Don't go to war over them or over trying to rob other people's resources. Will again and again here. Don't believe in exceptionalism. One group of people doesn't have an exceptional right that's greater than that of other people on the planet to survive. And will again and again here, I've heard it from mothers and bedsides and hospitals that were like death rows for infants in Iraq. I've heard it from mothers lamenting the funerals of their children who have just been bombed in Lebanon, in Gaza, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. We'll hear it from Yemen. Save the children. Save the Children is an organization, the name of an organization that was founded by a woman named Eglantine Jeb. World War I had ended, although wars really never end. And Eglantine and others started to realize that the blockade that was still being imposed on Germany was actually contributing toward the deaths of German children. And so she went out to Trafalgar Square with a group of people who had formed a committee to say that this, blo this blockade should be lifted. And her leaflet said that our blockade is causing millions of children to be at the risk of death. And she was protesting uh, at a time when that was considered to be treasonous. And so she was arrested. And she was tried and convicted. And she was fined. But the judge in her case, was so impressed by her sturdy and impassioned witness that he paid the fine that he just imposed. 
and that became the first contribution to the organization Save the Children, which is now telling us, as they kind of sound the alarm, that 85,700 Yemeni children have already died of disease and starvation because of the war in Yemen. And maybe one of the most famous lines that Eglantine Jeb ever said was this, every war is a war against children. Every war is a war against children. And here in the United States, as we pour resources into war and we can't meet the needs of people in our neediest neighborhoods, it is, in a sense, a war against children, and I can't help but also think about the children children whose mothers and fathers are in prison in a time of mass incarceration. And you could really speak on a war against the poor in the United States. So the sanity of declaring ourselves to be against all wars, to be abolitionists desiring to abolish all wars, to say we don't want the weapons, we don't want to think that our security lies in having arsenals of nuclear and conventional weapons, and to say that we believe that our security lies in extending the hand of friendship and fairness to our neighbors and to people all around the globe. The assertiveness of that voice could never be more necessary, I don't believe, than now as our capacity for destruction accelerates and as we seem to be led all around the world by warlords who've already distinguished themselves for their readiness to kill other people. So I'm again very, very grateful to be here with you today to be able to think with you about some of the people most in need of our asserted and consistent effort to put an end to war. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Anne. You. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, your assertion about Saudi's motives, uh, there's a scholar, Yusuf Lumi, who has a book out. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I can't remember the title. Destroying it. Yemen. Yeah, and what it means uh, for the Middle East. And it's, um, the thesis is what he said, but, but he ties it in with the whole financial system. Saudi needs that Yemeni oil because they've been lying about how much they have, and a lot of money is tied into that assessment. So it is really a really blatant resource war. And the ironic thing is, anyway, it's not a question, but I don't, I don't. So I want to thank Paul for calling our attention to one of the books that I think is the most uh, informative in uh, helping shape an understanding of the history of resource wars and financial uh, imposition of austerity measures on Yemen, which has everything to do with the current chaos that's going on. It's a very, very instructive book, and if you have a hard time plowing through it, I also want to recommend the podcasts of interviews with Isa Blumi, last name B-L-U-M-I. And what Blumi has said, um, and that Paul was uh, so succinctly summarizing, is that the Saudis have a, a great deal of cash. You know, they certainly appear opulent. The Saudi plane lands in any country, and you've got you know gold railings as the princes in their immaculate outfits descend. But um, when Saudi Arabia p put Aramco, its its major oil company, up. On, uh, and as it, uh, put it forth as an initial private offering, there really wasn't a big rush to try to invest. And it seems that major financiers are looking at Saudi Arabia and thinking, well, how long are your reserves going to last? How much resource do you have? And this seems to have inspired Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to say, well, what if we just take Yemen over, and does Yemen have resources? Certainly we're right to think of it as a broken and a battered and a beleaguered country. People are on the verge of famine. 16 million people could die of starvation and hunger and thirst. But it's got resources. The offshore oil resources haven't been 
extracted, but speculators think there are great reserves of energy there. The fisheries are enormous potentials. They've been destroyed very deliberately and systematically, but they could be, I guess, rebuilt. Uh, Yemen has a major network of ports in that chokehold of the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandab leading out for international trade, so it's very valuable in that regard as well. So it seems that both the United Arab Emirates and the Saudis would like to gain control of Yemen, but that's nothing new. As Paul mentioned, uh, major financiers um, have been presenting Yemenis with austerity packages designed to say you have to create this structural adjustment program and move your economy so that your wealth begins to service the major international corporations that would make loans and ostensibly help with, quote, development. Well, they've, re they've consistently been met with resistance by many people from Yemen. Salih Abdullah Saleh was the dictator of Yemen, and he would um, be very subservient, really, to some of these international bigs. But uh, the, the Arab Spring and other movements challenged Ali Abdullah Saleh's dictatorship, and people were becoming kind of desperate. The water table was lowering, the um, gas subsidies were being lowered also, there was high, high unemployment, and so people were starting to rise up. Well, the dictator left. Ali Abdullah Saleh said, okay, I'll quit being dictator, but if I leave after 33 years of dictatorship, you must put in my deputy a man named Abdurrahman Mansur Hadi. He was never elected. He was appointed as kind of a deal so that Salah would leave. Never, ever, ever were the demands of the people who couldn't survive on their land or the young people who couldn't find jobs or the people who wanted to be able to govern their own finances, thank you, never were those met. And so the Houthi were among quite a number of people who thought we can't keep on accommodating this kind of governance. So um, Abdul Rabu Mansur Hadi was sort of pushed out by the Houthi who led and eventually were joined by um, Abdullah Saleh uh, and, and they're now in Sana'a. Had they been allowed to work it out with other sectors of the country? Um, this would have been 2014, 2000. It's, it's possible that Yemen would have ended up not exactly being at peace, but not with the kind of horrible uh, wreckage that they now face. But instead, Saudi Arabia decided in 2015, we're going to go in and be involved in this war. And I think that Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman thought he could take care of it in a matter of weeks. Well, now it's 2019 and the war continues. And it's been a savage war that has directly gone after the infrastructure, um, both in terms of farms, roads, fisheries, uh, sewage and sanitation, electricity. So the good news in all of this for today and until President Trump decides whether or not to impose a veto is that the Senate and the Congress yesterday put through a bill saying the United States may no longer give military support to the Saudi Arabia. Now this isn't the panacea to solve everything because the United States supports Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates and other countries, including Egypt, in this coalition of nine countries led by Saudi Arabia. And the United States can bomb any place in Yemen that it wants under the idea of counterterrorism. But it's still an important measure that shows a rebuff to President Trump's desire to be in league with the Saudis. Um, will he veto that? The expectation is yes. And you're so lucky here because you have Robert Naiman of Just Foreign Policy to whom I would attribute much of the finest organizing on Capitol Hill over these last years regarding Yemen. I could make my next answer shorter. <laughs> Thank you.
in maximizing their profits. That's taken uh, granted, I think, uh, that they did for granted. But <coughs> I personally think that we are to be blamed more than mm -hmm. those people. So very articulately, the question is raised, how can we overcome a sense of being paralyzed or maybe even mesmerized by the, um, the weight and the burden of uh, knowing what the United States government and other governments have been responsible for, and also avoid assigning all blame to um, big powerful entities, be they political or corporate groups, and recognize our own responsibilities as individuals, as groups, who uh, do bear uh, some accountability. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think, by and large, the United States government doesn't really want from us our advice. <laughs> or care very much about our assent. I think what they want is our money. <laughs> they, they want us to bankroll the United States military, and, 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 and so it happens. You know, it, it, The group in the United States that commandeers so much of the budget, $717 billion for this year, can then proceed along with major corporations to have a vice-like grip on the education that you seek. Um, of course that education is vital, but you know, where will it come from? And right now, you've got the universities often compromised, even the faith-based groups can be compromised, uh, money talks in a lot of the civil society sectors. And, and I suppose in some ways, you know, we bear a little more responsibility because comparatively we have a little more freedom in the United States than in other countries. You know, I think about Iraq under Saddam Hussein, and, and people did not have much freedom to speak up. Uh, they didn't have freedom to whisper to each other. And, and that's what happens in many parts of the world that are under terrible dictatorships with threats of imprisonment and torture. 
So what do we risk? The risks we face are so minimal. They're, they're, they're almost laughable if you look at what others face in other parts of the world. And yet, people don't even take, not the risk, but the sort of um, jolt to their convenience, perhaps, that's caused by going out to a talk or going to some kind of a public gathering or writing a letter or contacting their elected representatives. So, it, it, you know, factor in also the importance of sports and entertainment uh, and, and what people will go through in order to be part of sports and entertainment and then bring the children in and, and what you go through to make sure the children are part of sports and entertainment. And, and a lot of people just don't really even have time to read the newspaper um, or, or catch the evening news. So, so once you're more and more detached from what's going on out there, there is a sense of insecurity that comes with that. I felt it. You know, if you were to quiz me right now and say, Kathy Kelly, how about naming every country in Africa and the capital of each country? Mm -hmm. I'm out. I, I can do better than many, but... And, and I care. I care a lot about what's going on in Africa right now. I'm trying to learn more. But I feel kind of insecure, because I know I don't even have anything approaching um, fluency or literacy in those issues. And so it's easier to say, well, then I'm not responsible to, to care. And, and of course, uh, my dad used to tell me um, when he was watching us get voices in the wilderness going, and that, <laughs> you knew, that was certainly a quixotic effort. My, and my dad lived with me at the time, and he'd say, "Hun, if you spread the peanut butter too thin, the bread rips. And yeah, dad, you're right. <laughs> so you can't take on every issue. But I think that we, we each can do what we can. And, and often find a sense of uh, encouragement by, by knowing that we are giving what we can to a particular issue and to, uh, you know, what we can give at different times in our lives, of course, is going to differ. When you need a season out, take it. Um, but I, I, because I've been a house guest in the wonderful home of Lan and Pam Richard and have known them for decades, I, I see what they've done, and you know, they're getting to the point where um, challenging dinergy and being able to help preserve the Vermilion River, if you don't know about that project, it's a great one to learn about. It's finally getting to the point where they're, they're, they're you know, rattling the cages in a sense of some of the people who bear responsibility to do something about the environmental degradation that's happening because of coal ash storage and the vulnerability of our waters. So, um, I think we catch courage from one another. And courage is ultimately the ability to control our fears. And, you know, I'm with you if you fear being irrelevant and you fear being uh, almost impotent. But um, that's never an excuse for inaction. So again, I'm, I'm glad for those of you who, who did come. I know that the kinds of uh, stories that I've come down here with over the decades uh, are, are ones that are not easy to hear. Um, and yet, when people ask me, well, well, do you have hope? I often think to myself, well, I'm not so sure I have hope, but this I know. There's no mother that I ever met in an, Iraq, in an Iraqi pediatrics ward who could afford my despair. Thank you. We don't have people that are, nobody cares that we're still in Afghanistan after 18 years. Um, I shouldn't say nobody, but on campus here, there's nobody demonstrating, nobody, there's no energy to get out, to, to stop the things that are being done in our name across the world. And I, I think the only thing that will stop that is a universal service type thing. Mm. People would have to serve in Peace Corps, ISTA, or the military for two years. Do you have any thoughts on that? I have been thinking quite a bit about the possibility that there will be a reinstatement of, I'll, I'll just say for now, something like the draft. Um, what was uh, mentioned is that uh, in 1973, the draft 
was ended and with that seemed to come an end to people feeling like they had enough stake in whatever war was going to be waged that they would actually turn out and demonstrate and so would it be better if a draft were reinstated. I suppose my um, flip answer, I don't mean just to try and be clever, would be, okay, bring the draft back, but start with 45 and up. Um, I, I never want to say, you know, send our youngest, who haven't had a chance to start their lives, off to loan themselves to kill or be, be killed in a, a war in some other pr people's land. But I also want to be very, very wary, very wary of a national service plan because we have a pretty classist society. There's plenty of stratification in our society. And so if you bring into the mix a national service plan, there's going to have to be some gradation in terms of types of service. Some are going to go to the military. Now who do you think is going to go to the military? The sons and daughters of the well-off or the privileged or the university educated, they'll probably be doing the, you know, Vista volunteer service that might look pretty good on a graduate program resume application. And it might end up being even more of a poverty draft than we already have. And uh, I don't think it would end the likelihood of United States involvement in foreign wars. And if those who are better off don't have to go fight in the wars, do we think that those who've been coping with mass incarceration and with the incredible violence of their own neighborhoods and then who might get forced into servitude and sent off to fight wars and come back with even more PTSD and trauma and violence, it doesn't seem like a good plan to me, but it will look good on paper. Um, you know, many of us grew up listening to Kennedy say, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, and it sounded pretty good. But I don't think that teaching people to kill or to plan for killing, it's murder, it's slaughter, it's uh, often done in the name of corporate financial interests. It's a mercenary kind of activity. I don't think that ever can be lifted up as a noble goal. So I hope that if these national service plans come into fruition, there are already, there have been military hearings all across the country. Some military brass sit down in a circle and they invite people to come and testify and give their impressions. And I, I don't know if there was much of a hue and cry in each city where these military hearings were held. Um, so I hope that there will be a lot more attentiveness to, to this type of plan. But remember, the military can market their war plans. Um, they've got plenty of money in their coffers to pay the highest uh, public relations type groups, and they've done it before and they'll continue to do it. So be very, very wary of being sold a bill of goods, which will um, look like a way to serve your country with patriotism. I don't believe that this country ought to be served in um, any kind of continuation of the menacing and brutal warlordism that we've pursued since the inception. Anne, I look to you for advice. It's gotten to be one o'clock. Do, do you have a vamoose order on this room? Or? It can be hard to sort of bring something like this down because I think people are so glad to hear from you and may have more questions. That said, one of your respectful of your... Oh, no, I'm happy. Sure, if there are any other questions, comments, thank you.
Thank you. So the question is, what can the goal of a talk like this be? Is it just to make people feel emptied and hollowed out and um, woeful? Uh, or can we be brought to our knees for a purpose? I wish Bob Neiman was here because he would say, yes, uh, get off your knees and let your elected representative know that you care about Yemen. So that's certainly one thing. When we find ourselves caring deeply about an issue, to do what we know to do, to go to the elected representatives, to go to the faith-based groups, to go to the media people, to write the letter to the editor. I mean, it may not seem anywhere near commensurate to the crimes that are being committed, but at least those steps have to be taken. I think a deep yearning to put an end to war is essential. And I think it's important for all of us to give ourselves a collective pat on the back because the world came so close to ending a war before it started when the United States went to war against Iraq. Had that um, time of demonstrating and protesting been just a little bit more vigorous, if there had been a little bit more stick to stay in the streets, it's possible that the United Nations would have come forth with their conclusion Looked everywhere, there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. There's no way to justify Tony Blair and George Bush, who were getting pretty darn nervous. Tony Blair had communicated to George Bush, you better get that war rolling, otherwise I'm not going to be able to bring the UK on it, in on it after a declaration is made by the UN. And, and the UN could have maybe sped things up. I certainly felt that way living in Baghdad waiting for the bombs to fall. But the, the seven million people worldwide had demonstrated against that war. Do you think people went out in those demonstrations because their mainstream media told them what was happening in Iraq? No, they were learning from Witness for Peace, from Dominican sisters, from little voices in the wilderness, from Witness, uh, sorry, from uh, many different non-governmental organizations that had gone over to Iraq, came back, hit the ground running, and said, this is what we've seen and heard. What prevented the United States from intervening in Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador? I'm not saying everything's hunky-dory now in those countries, but the United States was certainly on a path of military intervention, and they were stopped by constant, steady, Resistance, nonviolent resistance, much of it coming from grassroots United States people. Uh, you know, World War I was almost stopped. There are ways to mobilize people, and we aren't alone in this. We are four to six percent of the world's population. Ninety-four percent of the world's population would love to see the best equipped, one of the most mm, free societies rise to the occasion and speak up and save the planet. So I think we have solidarity. We have numbers beyond the United States. So, so yes, it's, it's likely to feel worn out and tired because the warmongers have commandeered so much of our resource, our energy, our ingenuity, our potential. But we don't have to cede it to them. And I think, again, in my own experience, feeling like I'm sort of charged with coming back to the United States with the stories. I mean, I can tell you in the rock and those pediatric wards, you didn't just sit by the bed of a mother. Pretty soon you were in the bed. A mother sitting cross-legged on the bed with an infant in her arms and maybe her sister in the bed with her would pull you in and embrace you and maybe cry on your shoulder until your t shoulder was damp with her tears. But she wanted her message to come back to the United States. So we, we do need to pay attention. We do need to try our best to become literate in the stories of the people who bear the brunt of our wars and who can't escape. I come back with those stories because I can wave the blue passport. There's no justice to it. There's no reason why I should be the one who gets out if I've been in Gaza when I was in Iraq, when I go to Afghanistan. But we can try as best we can to let those stories of the people who can't escape, who day in, day out bear the brunt of our bombs and our wars, to have their voices deafen the annoying and shrill 
and undereducated voices of the people who keep pushing war on the United States. Um.